the uh, National Institute of Health tells us that 14 out of the top 15 causes of death in the world today are chronic inflammatory diseases. The only one that's not is unintentional injuries, like an accident. Mm -hmm. Everything else of the top 15 causes of death are chronic inflammatory diseases. So how important is it that we learn how to reduce our chronic inflammation? Small world. <laughs> yeah, nice. And I know, uh, so do you You talk on a lot of different, are you still practicing as a doctor? No, no. Um, well, I'll do, I'll do a virtual consult about once every two weeks. And uh, uh, they've got to get through my staff, meaning it's got to be an extremely difficult case. And okay. I, I do Sherlock Holmes. You know, I'm, I'm, my, my emphasis is to identify why this is happening. And then it's much easier to recommend therapeutic protocols, uh, ozone or w whatever it should be, once you understand where this is coming from. One of my basic premises is we have to stop thinking like medics that for this symptom, you take this, or for this symptom, you take that. And for this symptom, you have to find out why is this happening to you? And you have to address the lifestyle that's causing that problem. And so people don't do that so much anymore. You know, your company, your business is a great reputation, really useful product, but it's not the answer to why people have whatever they have. It's not an ozone deficiency, right? right? Uh, but it's so very helpful as a tool. But if they focus on that and they start feeling better, which is great, but they keep living the lifestyle that caused the problem, it's going to manifest somewhere else. So yeah. you so you have to find out where is this coming from. I published a chapter. You know, well, you should hit record. We are recording. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I published a chapter in a cardiovascular medicine textbook uh, for medical schools, and it was on the role of wheat-related disorders in cardiovascular disease. And what I pointed out was that uh, every cardiologist knows that atherosclerosis, the primary mechanism for most cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis is a chronic inflammatory condition. That 1986, the studies first started coming out that atherosclerosis is always an inflammatory mechanism. So the cardiologist is really stuck with two different lines of thought that they have to address. One, deal with the symptoms, whatever they should be, and two, deal with the inflammation. But they're not taught how to deal with the inflammation. They're not taught to think this way at all. Neither are the neurologists or the gastroenterologists or the pediatricians. They're taught to deal with the symptoms. So it's a conflict for doctors. And once they understand where is the inflammation coming from? I have to examine where, is it food sensitivity? Is it mold in the house? Is it emotional complications because of stress and trauma in someone's life? You have to identify, you have to include where is the inflammation coming from to address any chronic disease that a person has. And the uh, National Institute of Health tells us that 14 out of the top 15 causes of death in the world today are chronic inflammatory diseases. The only one that's not is unintentional injuries, like an accident. Mm -hmm. Everything else of the top 15 causes of death are chronic inflammatory diseases. So how important is it that we learn how to reduce our chronic inflammation? Yeah, pro probably pretty important, I would guess. Yeah, probably. And so <laughs> I, I noticed, I mean, just kind of looking through your website, like all the different topics that you've written on, that you speak on, and that kind of thing. Is inflammation kind of the common thread that you're weaving throughout those topics? Uh, pretty much. Pretty much. I, I don't know that, uh, uh, well, a, a lot on autoimmune diseases, and that's always, you know, if you're going to arrest an auto, I don't care if it's lupus or MS or whatever it is. You have to address where's the inflammation coming from. And that's, yeah. wh that, that's why every autoimmune disease that is looked into, every single one is going up 
of four to nine percent a year every year, four to nine percent a year. And it was the World Health Organization that published two years ago that our lifespan is going down for the last four years now. Every year, the projected lifespan in the U.S. is going down. Last one between 2020 and 2021, two years, the expected lifespan for males went down 1.8 years, meaning people born today, a male born today, is projected to live 1.8 years less than his father. And for females, it was 1.4 years. And that just was from 2020 to 2021. It went down two years that we are in a um, uh, enhanced, aggressive, inflammatory world, an inflammatory yeah. lifestyle. Uh, and we, we have to address this mechanism, irrespective of what health complaint you've got. So you mentioned like uh, removing things from lifestyle or, you know, cutting things. Do you see more often it's about removing something from somebody's life rather than adding to it? Or oh, uh, sure. what, is, what yeah. is usually kind of the fundamental issue there that you're seeing? You bet. Uh, you can certainly identify easily enough if someone has nutrient insufficiencies or deficiencies, and that certainly contributes to anemia or any other condition that you might be addressing. But the question is, why do they have a nutrient insufficiency or deficiency? Is it an absorption problem because their microbiome is so far out of balance and their microbiome's inflamed? Is it a food sensitivity problem? Is it um, uh, pancreatic, gallbladder, liver dysfunction, not producing enough digestive enzymes? Where is it coming from? Uh, so that is a critical component in any health complaint we're looking at is to include this separate line of thinking. You know, everyone wants to feel better. There's nothing wrong with that. So what do I take to feel better? Very important. But you also have to address where is this coming from? Where are the inflammatory triggers in my life? And the majority of the time, uh, the most common source of environmental triggers is what's on the end of your fork. That yeah. is, that's most common. And people don't want to hear that. You know, they, <laughs> they, they yeah. love, they love their pizza, you know, or whatever else it should be. You know, know. He, here's a, uh, here's a concept that really helps for people to uh, be more comfortable with this inflammatory thing. Um, one of my mentors and friend is Professor Alessio Fasano uh, at Harvard. He is a professor of medicine, Harvard Medical School, professor of nutrition, Harvard School of Public Health, the director of the Celiac Research Center at Harvard, chief of pediatric gastroenterology at yeah, Harvard. He's, he's credential. He's credential. He's got five titles. Uh, any one title is a lifelong goal for people at the top of their game. He's got five. Right. Uh, and we think he's going to win the Nobel Prize. We do because it's him and his team that identified the mechanism by which leaky gut occurs, the production of the protein called zonulin. And they published on that in 1997. And for 20 years now, more, they've been publishing article after article after article. Uh, that it's irrefutable now. And what they're teaching at Harvard right now is what Pisano refers to as the perfect storm in the development of chronic inflammatory diseases, that uh, there are five pillars in the perfect storm. The first one is genetics. And there's nothing you can do about genetics. You know, that's the deck of cards you were dealt and people talk about turning off genes and turning on genes. You can't turn genes off. They don't turn off. You can dim them down. Genes operate on a dimmer switch. And the goal is to dim down the genes of inflammation and turn up the genes of anti-inflammation. That's the goal. Bottom line goal in all action we take is to reduce the inflammatory uh, mechanisms, turning on the inflammatory genes, producing the inflammation, causing the disease that you've got, whatever that disease is. 
So the first one is genes. The second one is the environmental trigger, which are the fingers on the round knob of the dimmer switch of your genes. That what you're exposed to turns your genes up or turns your genes down. It's our environmental triggers. And the yeah. environmental triggers are, there's two categories. One is what's outside your body, and the other is what's inside your body. And inside your body, it's the accumulation of toxic chemicals, uh, metals, um, stress hormones that accumulate inside the body. Uh, so you, you have to deal with both what's outside the body, and the most common source of environmental triggers is what's on the end of your fork. That's most common, but also the air you breathe, you live in a moldy house. Well, what's not too bad? You know, it's just a little mold on the shower curtain. I don't smell it. Well, that doesn't mean anything, but we'll put that on your tombstone. It wasn't too bad, <laughs> right? right? Famous last words. <laughs> Famous last words. Uh, so number two of the perfect storm are environmental triggers. Number three of the perfect storm in the development of chronic inflammatory diseases the, the mechanism for 14 of the 15 top causes of death. Number three is that those environmental triggers activating genes of inflammation create what's called dysbiosis. It's a geek word that means too many bad guys in your gut, not enough good guys. That the balance is out of balance. We've all got bad guys in our gut. That's part of living on the planet. But you want a good, strong amount of the good guys that protect you. But when you develop chronic inflammatory diseases, number four, number three on that perfect storm is dysbiosis, too many bad guys, not enough good guys. Now, number three, too many bad guys creates all this inflammation in your gut, which then creates number four, the leaky gut. And the way to think about leaky gut is Mrs. Patient, your digestive tract is a tube. Your GI tract goes from the mouth to the other end. One big long tube winds around in the middle there, but it's one big long tube. The inside of the tube is lined with cheesecloth. So when you swallow a piece of meat, you know, and we usually chew three, four times, we should chew 15 times, but we don't, and you swallow it down, you got this glob of hamburger you know, that's going down into the stomach and we think it goes in the bloodstream. No, it's got to be broken down. Think of a pearl necklace and the acid in your stomach undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. Now you have a string of pearls and your digestive enzymes snip that pearl necklace, those proteins, smaller and smaller and smaller, it's clip, 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 until they're down to the size of each pearl of the pearl necklace. That's called an amino acid. And that those are the building blocks for new muscle and brain cells and bone cells. So the amino acids, when the proteins get broken down to each pearl of the pearl necklace, then they go right through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. And your bloodstream's just a highway. You know, everything's going in the same direction, but it's all bumper cars in there. There's no lanes. Everything's bouncing around into each other, right? But the, the, the meat or any other food can't get through the cheesecloth until it's been broken down small enough. But what happens when you have dysbiosis, the inflammation in the gut, you get tears in the cheesecloth. And when you get tears in the cheesecloth, now, bigger molecules of that meat called macromolecules that haven't yet been broken down small enough get through the tears in the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. Now they're on the highway. And your immune system, and so the leaky gut, that's number four of the five pillars. And now these macromolecules are in the bloodstream, and your immune system, trying to protect you, says, What is this? This is not something I can use to make new bone cells or brain cells. I better fight this. Now you get systemic inflammation, number five in the perfect storm, that your, your immune system trying to protect you from this foreign substance creates the inflammation that now is circulating through the bloodstream, fighting these molecules. 
And if you pull at a chain, the chain always breaks at the weakest link, always. It's at one end, the middle, the other end, it's your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys. Wherever your genetic weak link is, that's where the chain is going to break. And so the more inflammation, that's the pull on the chain. So eventually, here comes the disease. Mm -hmm. But th this, is, this is the mechanism they're teaching at Harvard Medical School right now. And much, much, much more detail and much geekier. But that's the basics is the perfect storm in the development of chronic inflammatory diseases. So what would be like, uh, do you run diagnostics to find, um, well, you yes. mentioned uh, genetics and then genetic expression and then um, leaky gut. Are you running diagnostics to try to identify it as early as possible? And if so, what are you doing? Absolutely. Absolutely. The rule is test. Don't guess. Don't shotgun. You know, if you want to feel better, okay, you know, I noticed that if I take this after I've exercised for a while, I just feel better. You know, whatever. Okay, fine, fine. But when you have a dis-ease, you need to identify the mechanism. Where is it coming from? And, uh, you know, I started talking about this on stage in 2004 uh, about wheat and gluten. And I'm, I've been considered a nutcase ever since. <laughs> well, maybe not anymore. I'm sure it's changed over the years. Uh, it has in most places. Yeah. Uh, un unbelievable that even a few years ago, there were still gastroenterologists saying there's no such thing as a leaky gut. What nonsense. Hundreds and hundreds of studies now. But yeah. Well, there's a big breakdown between academia and doctors. There is. Especially if they're not reading it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, but the rule is tests don't guess. But I started talking about this a long time ago that the tests are inaccurate. Um, uh, and my primary emphasis for years has been on gluten and wheat and the dangers of wheat. And the uh, all doctors were trained that if you have a problem with wheat, you've got celiac disease. And that is a historical misconception that celiac disease, the development of celiac disease may be the weak link in the chain and you develop celiac disease, but that's not the exclusive of what happens when you pull on the chain. And wheat sensitivity, gluten sensitivity is the primary food in our food chain that pulls on the chain. It's the primary one and it's the only food that is a permanent sensitivity once you've crossed the line of tolerance. For everything else, you may outgrow it. You may, if you take a break from that food for six months and the immune system calms down, you may be able to reintroduce a little bit and you're fine with it, possibly with dairy or soy or eggs or peanuts. You may desensitize to them, but with wheat, you cannot that your immune system produces what are called memory B cells. They never forget. That's the goal in childhood vaccinations is to produce memory B cells to measles or rubella or any of the other childhood vaccinations is to produce memory B cells. So if you're ever exposed again, if you were vaccinated with those, if you ever exposed again, your memory B cells, whoa, this one's a problem. Let's fight this one right now so that you don't have a problem. Wheat is the only food that does the same thing. And so you can't, you can't, well, I can have a little. Really? Show me the science on that. There is none, right? You can't really? be, a, there is none. You can't be a little pregnant. You can't, is, have, you can't have a little wheat after you've crossed the line of tolerance and your immune system is fighting wheat which I would assume a lot of people have just considering the amount that we eat. But um, I've also like, is there any uh, like, so gluten's the problem, right? Is there, or is it something beyond the wheat? Is it, or is it well, just gluten? Well, uh, we're confusing words there. Okay. Gluten is a family of proteins that uh, there's gluten in rice. There's gluten in corn. There's gluten in wheat, rye, barley, uh, oats that gluten is a category of proteins, but it's the gluten in wheat, rye, and barley that no human can digest, none. 
and it activates an immune response in all humans. Maureen Leonard, a famous gastroenterologist at Harvard, did a literature review of over 60 studies on this topic, and she published in the Journal of the American Medical Association um, six, six years ago. And she said, um, this immune response to wheat occurs in all humans, everyone. And it occurs within five minutes of the wheat coming out of the stomach into the first part of the small intestine. It occurs within five minutes. And when you see the videos of that, you go, wow, wow, look at that. That is cool. Now I understand what this is because you see it. And, and when doctors see the videos, it changes their, their paradigm about all of this. So in my talks, I'm always showing the videos of that. Your question was on testing. And the answer is yes, the rule is test, don't guess. But the problem has been the tests that our doctors have used are tests that were designed in the 1980s and the 1990s. And they're okay, but they're, you know, they're some they're they're accurate, but they're not comprehensive. Sure. That we we now know there are 62 different peptides of the wheat proteins. Uh, when you can't digest it completely, there are 62 different peptides that activate an immune response. And almost every doctor is checking one called alpha glidin. And if that comes, and about 50% of celiacs will be elevated to that. And I don't know the percentage with non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, I don't think I've seen a study on that. Uh, for just alpha glidin, uh, I'm, I'm I'm not sure. So I, I can't yeah, but we're getting a limited that. scope. Yeah, we're 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 getting a limited view. Well, the technology came out in um, uh, a laboratory opened in 2015. That's game changing. And uh, uh, Mayo Clinic published the first paper I saw about this, and they referred to it as a new era in laboratory medicine. And they had no financial ties at all to this lab or the company. And the lead author of that study is a gastroenterologist named Joe Murray, Dr. Joe Murray. Now, there are four horsemen in celiac disease. As I said, I've been teaching about celiac and gluten since 2004. And there were four guys who kept publishing new research, new articles, uh, multiple times a year, every year. And there was Peter Green at Columbia, Stefano Guandolini, University of Chicago, Alessio Fasano at Harvard, and Joe Murray at Mayo. And Dr. Murray is the one that wears bow ties, uh, leather patches on the elbows of his sport coat, horn rim glasses, the geek of geeks. Sure. And just, just a wonderful man. Uh, and his articles are wonderful to read. So here's a paper that comes out from Joe Murray and his team at Mayo saying a new era in laboratory medicine and the accuracy of silicone chip technology is between 97 and 99%. And you go, whoa, because all the other labs out there, if you can get the information from them and you usually can't, if you can get the information, their sensitivity and specificity is in the mid 70s to low 80 percentile range, which means a test is wrong two or three out of 10 times. You, you draw blood and I challenge doctors in every talk I do now, I don't care where I am in the world, I'll do that, is that when they draw blood, draw a second tube out of the same venipuncture. Label the second tube Joe Smith and send it to the lab ordering the same test that you're ordering with the blood draw that you, for this patient. Now the doctor will have to pay for this second test himself. You don't tell the lab what you're doing because you, know, you don't want them to have any input. You just want their results. And when the test results come back, here's your patient test results and here's Joe Smith. And most of the time, they're very different. Not just a little bit different, very different. And you wonder, should I talk to the patient about the test results and say everything's great? 
or should I talk to the patient about the test results to say, there's a problem here? The same blood. Then you start to realize laboratory testing has not been that accurate, and we depend on it completely. Well, as Mayo Clinic says, there's a new era in laboratory medicine. It's silicone chip technology. And when you do that, 97 to 99%, and I did three patients um, with double blind draws, and it was always within two to 3%, which is very acceptable by my standards. Uh, um, with uh, this, And the lab is called Vibrant Wellness. And uh, I recommend all of your listeners to go to my website, thedr.com, and look up the wheat zoomer test because you zoom in on the problem, download the information, take it to your doctor and say, would you order this test for me, please? And they'll likely say no, because they don't know anything about it. They've not heard about this dichotomy and lab sensitivity and specificity. They've never asked the question. And their, you know, their hospital does the testing it's going to do. But if they say no, you order the test on my website. We'll send you the kit. You and we'll help you find a phlebotomist and you send it into the lab and here come the results. And you say, wow. So there's a wheat zoomer, a dairy zoomer, a corn zoomer, a lectin zoomer, a brain zoomer called the neural zoomer plus. You do these tests that are highly accurate. Now you start to understand where the inflammation may be coming from. Mm -hmm. So the rule is test don't, don't guess, but you have to have accurate testing. This is all part of my training. Pro I have a training program called Certified Gluten Practitioners, uh, CGP, CertifiedGlutenPractitioner.com. And so for healthcare practitioners to take my 14-hour online course, and their jaw drops again and again, and I just show the science. Here's the quote from this study. Here's the quote from this study. Here's the quote. Because I love reading the articles and then talking about this. It's my passion. Uh, as you can tell, I've got some juice on this because everyone needs to understand, at least at a basic level, you want tests that are accurate and yeah. you want to identify the environmental triggers causing the inflammation that's produced your MS or produced your rheumatoid or produced your child's seizures. It doesn't matter what you, you've got. It's all chronic inflammatory diseases. So you have to identify where's the inflammation coming from, along with the therapies you do to address the symptoms so the patient starts feeling better right away. Mm -hmm. So what motivates you to do this work? Because you're pretty prolific in this uh, industry, especially on the gluten side of things. You know, you've been growing kind of your organization and, and getting a bigger impact and reach. What's kind of motivated you to, to continue doing that? There's a poem that I used to have in my office when I first opened my practice. I had it in every room. Uh, and that was Valentine's Day, 1980. We opened our practice. And the poem is George Bernard Shaw. And part of the poem says, this is the true joy in life. The being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. The being a force of nature instead of a fever, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances, complaining the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I'm of the opinion my life belongs to the whole, and it's my privilege to do for it whatever I can. Life is no brief candle to me. It's sort of a splendid torch that I have a hold of for the moment and want to burn as brightly as possible before passing it on to future generations. That's it. You know, uh, finding, you know, Mark Hyman has a new book coming out on staying young. And one of the 10 principles is find your passion. Find what just gives you juice. And that keeps you young of heart. Mark Twain said there are two, the two most important days in a person's life are the day they were born and the day they find out why. Yeah. In terms of finding your passion, I mean, it seems like that can have a lot of different outlets, right? Uh, like absolutely. you could have, 
you you could have been working in a totally different capacity still feeling passionate about that like how do you feel like you hone in what is really because because the passion is really it's like the intersection of what you're good at and what motivates you and what is like a contributor to you know what you feel like is important and that kind of stuff like how do you think you kind of hone in on what that thing is because I could go and become, I don't know, a skydiving instructor or something. And I'm never going to know if I'm going to, if that's really the thing uh, that I would feel passionate about that. Is there a lot of things and how do we hone it in? My son, when he was 17, thinking about what university to go to, uh, I said to him, when did, my son had a 4.3 in high school, one of those kind of guys. Uh, summer camp was statistics, not soccer. He wanted to go to Northwestern summer camp for statistics. Really? Okay. Okay. Great. And at 17, I said to him, you know, Jason, I don't care. I really don't care if you go to college or not. And he looked at me and he said, I don't care. I said, Jason, if you look at a brick wall and you say, wow, how'd they do that? You know, we, we took a family trip to Italy and some of the places we went, the, the um, ceilings were brick ceilings, arched brick ceilings. And he really loved that. So I use that as an example. If you look at a brick wall and you say, how did they do that? And you're looking at brick walls everywhere you go. You know, if you buy a Ford, you see all the Fords on the highway all of a sudden, right? So you're looking at brick walls or... You're drawing pictures of brick wood. You go find the best, best brick wall maker there is. I'll finance you for a year or so. You know, go work for free just to see if you really have juice for this. Or if you want to do, if you need to do rock and roll, I mean, really, man, you know, it's in your blood. You just got to do rock and roll. You, you go do rock and roll for a year. I'll finance you. I'm financing college. I'll finance you. But if you don't have something that grabs you by the nuts, excuse me, but just grabs you and won't let go, you go to school because that's where you find more exposure to different things than anywhere else. And my prayer is that you find something that you just got to do in your life. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as you don't hurt people, it doesn't matter what it is. And I promise. You follow that path, you're going to be a happy man. You'll have a great family and you'll make a valuable contribution to the planet. Do you so think everybody exposure. do you think everybody has that in them that they're going to have like a job that juices them that's going to No, they're not going to have a job that juices them, but they well, have I the mean, capacity like within to them. have a job. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Every human being has this. It's just that we're so squashed, you know, our son, um, I have a two-year-old now. Uh, and my daughter is uh, over 40. My son is 39, and I have a two-year-old. <laughs> and um, our goal with him is to avoid suppression in every interaction with him. So we never say no, never. Oh, Gio, Gio, Gio that's hot, hot. Don't, it's hot. If you touch that, it's really hot. Or when he wants to go outside by the pool, say, Gio, see, the, uh, the floor's wet out there. and You could slip and fall. Remember, you hurt your head. So let's put your shoes on. But you don't say, no, don't go outside until, uh, no, you can't go outside if you don't put your shoes on. We don't do that. We're, we're trying our best not to. But all of us grew up with that type of suppression from parents that loved us and wanted to just protect us in whatever way they could. We all grew up with that kind of suppression on everything in life. You know, when you look, just watch a family with a young kid. You watch for five minutes, 10 minutes, you see it happening again and again and again. So the child who's trying to develop their own personality, their own way of walking through this life is being suppressed, maybe has to sneak around when they get a little older or something, you know, we all laugh and giggle. Yeah, yeah. When I was in high school, I, you know, whatever. You know, but we have to sneak around because we can't be ourselves. We, we, we've had so much suppression. Our society is just so locked into this 
um, go to school, sit in that chair, don't talk, memorize, regurgitate. I think there's a better way. And so we're exploring to find a better way. We all do. And sometimes it takes a few years to give permission to really let yourself feel. You, you hear stories of, of uh, bank uh, senior executives who retire early and become artists or become carpenters. They love working with wood, you know, uh, or people in one industry who, as they become more of themselves, they go to something completely different and they're as happy as can be. So finding the joy of life. You know, if you, uh, we, uh, I raised my family in Chicago and it was during the era of the Bulls and the six championships of the Chicago Bulls. And we were blessed to have tickets um, every year. Uh, but one of the things about Michael Jordan is that he always talked about the joy of the game that he was always answering. If you watch any of the interviews with him, he constantly is referring to the joy of the game. And I believe he meant it uh, uh, for him and others in the NBA, like Magic Johnson and a few others. They, they just, it was their passion, right? And mm -hmm. so they, they were the best. And I think we all have that, that um, uh, potential but most of us have never exercised that muscle. Most of us have never given ourselves permission to explore some of that. Um, so yeah. I think- And it can be in a lot of things too. Like, I mean, it could be being a caretaker of family oh, or whatever it is. Yeah, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't have to manifest as a career. Um, no, not the, you know, the best of something or, no, absolutely not. As long yeah. as you don't hurt people. As long as, <laughs> yeah. as long as the energy is clean and you're doing a service to humanity, whatever it is. So when you're, uh, you have a two-year-old now, or you were referring back to your. No, we have a two-year-old now. Awesome. That's, that, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. We have four kids, eight, six, uh, three and one, but the concept of saying no, I like on the, the one side where it's, um, you're teaching the mechanisms of how things work. So they're understanding boundaries, not by this binary concept of that's a right. yes or a no for the sake of being a yes or a no, but they're understanding the mechanisms of, well, on a spectrum of ideas, that's probably not the best way to go about it. You know, that's exactly uh, right. But don't, don't you think there, do you think there's a time and a place for like a hard no? Cause like, uh, I mean, only, only if their health is in danger. <laughs> Uh, and like, what would be an example? Running into the street without stopping and looking, mm -hmm. you know, putting, putting something into an electrical outlet. Is that difficult, like energetically difficult for you to, cause you're, you're always having to explain concepts to a two-year-old who like a no is a really quick concept, right? Like yeah. they can understand that pretty young. Um, but if you have like boundaries in your household or whatever those would be now you're having to ha attempt dialogue with a two-year-old that's like it's complex it's difficult right do you yeah. do you find that it's like pretty energetically demanding to do that yeah yeah for me it is for my wife it's not um she's full-time mom and she is just in heaven and loving her her world of what she's doing and she talks to him and she talks to him in Polish. My wife is Polish. Mm -hmm. She's almost exclusively talking to him in Polish. I talk to him in English. And the nanny and the cook talk to him in Spanish because they don't speak English. We, we live in Costa Rica. and so oh, I didn't he, know that. So he's speaking three languages now. Sometimes as he's talking, he'll say the word truck and then something in Polish. So I'll say to my wife, what did he say? Right. So, um, uh, but he understands, I'm startled as to how much he understands that my, my wife has been doing this since day one, just talking to him as a regular person. Um, and uh, he understands, and our friends are just, just uh, in awe, literally in awe of, they say how smart he is. He, he's so smart. Well, We've well, that's not, what happens we, when you show them the range of choices that exist. 
Yeah, exactly. And it'll be interesting for you with four children, eight and below, that you'll notice how often there is some restriction that you unconsciously were putting on them in, in your language with them. Yeah, I'm sure I do. I mean, uh, not intentionally. Me like too. The intentions Me are too. always to right. draw, draw out the best of them. But yeah, I'm sure there's times when I'm tired and I'm just like, no, yeah, right, <laughs> like, right, right. just, just no, I don't want to explain. Right. Um, but, but we, we don't give our children the understanding that there are times when they just want to, you know, be a child, you know, we want them usually to respond a specific way. And we have to have understanding. Our son had his first fever about, oh, uh, let's see, uh, my grandchildren came down at Christmas and my grandson had, was just getting over whooping cough. And so when they left after the holidays, my son came down with a fever for three or four days. And I said, good. I said to my wife, good, good, good. She said, what do you mean good? No, it's good. He's exercising his immune system because he has never been sick. And uh, he needs to exercise his immune system. And the rule is, as long as it's below 103.5, just make him comfortable. It's okay if it stays at 102 for a couple of days. It's okay. It's okay. His immune system is fighting bacteria or fighting viruses right now. That's what a fever is. It's to kill yeah. unwanted visitors, right? So, you know, during that time, you know, he was a little um, short, just wanted to be nurtured. And then for a week or two afterwards, um, he wasn't the old self that had been. His fever was back to normal, but, you know, he was rebounding. He was trying to come back. And so it required a little more understanding on my part when he was taking food from his plate and throwing it on the floor. And uh, yeah. I said, no, no, Gio, don't throw it on the floor because see, honey, see, we get ants when the food's on the floor. You know, or something like that. And we don't want all <laughs> the ants. He might want the ants there. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> no. well, that, that's true. He too. might be like, that, oh, that, well, that, uh, I'll invite him over more often. But uh, yeah, but that's point. also a great example of um, like how symptoms are not always the enemy. Mm -hmm. Like it's your body's expression of dealing with the insults that it has inside that's it. Exactly right. A fever is not a problem ever. Um, a fever is the immune system activating, trying to protect you from something. The question is, what's it trying to protect you from? And if you've got constant uh, strep concentrations in your body, and we all know about strep throat, but it's all over. If you have just a large amount of strep in some area, the immune system doesn't recognize it, so you don't have a fever, and then you do a little too much of something you shouldn't, like the wrong foods or partying that diminishes your immune system function, all of a sudden, here comes another fever, or here comes another infection. These people that get recurrent ear infections and recurrent um, infections of any type, vaginal infections, uh, here comes another one. Well, there is a concentration of those bacteria, yeast, viruses in the body that's higher. They're bad guys, and there's too many of those bad guys. And at some point, you cross the line the threshold of being able to deal with that. Uh, your immune system gets weakened a little bit more, and now that concentration triggers the immune response. And it happens again and again. People with recurrent infections, you have to ask, why are they having recurrent infections? Not try a new antibiotic or a new natural product um, e exclusively. Of course, you want to feel better, but you also have to ask, why does this keep happening? Where is the inflammation coming from? And if you remember, I said there are two uh, categories of environmental triggers, those outside the body and those already inside the body. Mm -hmm. And so do you tie that concept of like symptomology is not always bad to chronic disease or does it not apply there? I don't quite understand the question. So like if if um, you have symptoms of heart disease, that's again, kind of your body eliciting certain effects to try to deal with the root problem. Right, that's always the case. Symptoms are always the result of something out of balance. If it's not trauma, you know, you fell down, you break a leg or you fell down and you bruise your hip or something, it's gonna be sore for a few days uh, from trauma. 
But anything else, as far as I know, it's a cumulative stressors. Uh, but even the soreness, though, like, is your body signal to stay away from this? Stop using it. It's hurt. It needs time to repair. Unfortunately, uh, what I've learned, and that you know, for the last year or so, um, when I squat down, I've had a hard time standing up. Some my my leg muscles are almost painful in trying to stand up, and I said, "What the heck is this?" What's going on here? Yeah, all right, all right. I'm 71, but okay, that's not supposed to happen. What's going on here? And it wasn't until I have a coach, you know, that I trained with by Zoom, because uh, we're in the jungles of Costa Rica. Uh, and one day we did roller on a roller, just putting your body weight on your legs and rolling on the roller. It was so painful just so utterly painful that my legs were just all congested. They were congested. And after that session, I was popping up and down with no discomfort whatsoever. And about two weeks later, uh, they were getting sore again. It was, I was having a hard time standing up. So if I went to my orthopedic surgeon and said, anytime I bend over to tie my shoes or to pick something up off the floor, I get pain in my legs. I have a hard time standing up. He's going to give me some type of prescription for an anti-inflammatory right, or something like that. But it was a mechanical problem because my lymphatics were blocked up, not flushing out the lactic acid from using my leg muscles. So all that congestion was there. And I had it for a year trying to figure out what is this? I couldn't figure out what it was. I thought it was some disease. I did some tests for it, couldn't identify anything. And me, I'm supposed to be the Sherlock Holmes and it was a simple accumulation of crud in my legs, lactic acid buildup in my legs. You know, so, you know, you, 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 the more you ask the questions, where is this coming from? The more you learn about how your body functions. So you kind of, you made the common thread of inflammation as being the root of chronic disease, just kind of generally. But I would assume that depending on the diagnostic is you're going to have different interventions for people. It's still not like a yeah. one way, one application route, even though you're seeing this common theme among all these different diseases. Yeah, that's correct. It's, it's not a never, never. There are some common things to begin with uh, usually, but it's one path of investigation that must be included with symptom relief. So what are your, some of your, the interventions that you like to use? Or, I mean, you oh, said- the most, the most common one, uh, almost well, anyone that I'm gonna see has these tests done before I, I'm ever gonna talk to them. It's the Wheat Zoomer and the Neural Zoomer Plus uh, because it's the most comprehensive test for a wheat sensitivity. Whether it's gluten or not, doesn't matter. There's other components in wheat that are a problem. But if you but if you already know that the output is like because you said there's no good upside to eating wheat, if you already know the output for everybody you talk to, don't eat wheat. Why do you bother with testing on wheat? Compliance. Just to people, prove it to them. Yeah, because people are yeah. not going to give up the most common food that they eat. And it is the most common food I'm eating in the Western world. 20 to 52 percent of all calories come from wheat. Most of the B vitamins that people get is from the enrichment of wheat products if they're not taking vitamins. It's an essential component in our diet right now. And so they're not going to comply with the most common food that they eat unless they get educated and understand, here's the mechanism that's contributing to the inflammation, producing your multiple sclerosis or producing your child's seizures or producing your joints rheumatoid arthritis. Here's the mechanism. And the laboratory, when they came out in 2015, they made it such a competitive test that they, they included the most comprehensive markers to identify a leaky gut in the wheat zoomer test. So not only do you find out if the most common food that people eat is a primary source of inflammation in your body. You also find out if you've got a leaky gut 
And that is the uh, baseline you start from. And the other test I do with every patient is the Neural Zoomer Plus. There's a test called the Neural Zoomer. That was the original. It looks at eight markers of inflammation in the brain. The Neural Zoomer Plus looks at 53 markers of inflammation in the brain. And the reason we do that is because um, there's a pandemic going on that people have no clue about. Uh, as an example, I mean, I can give you study after study after study, but just as an example that should rock your boat, Blue Cross Blue Shield, arguably the largest for-profit health insurance company in the English language, published in March of 2020 saying, we got a problem here, that between 2013 and 2017, in that four-year period, there was a 407% increase in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, not 10%, not 20%, not 100%, 407% in diagnosis of Alzheimer's in 30 to 44 year olds. That's you and your generation, a 407% increase in four years. And that's the most current statistics that we can find. They've not broken it out by age group since then. That everyone, and you do NeuroZoomer Plus, every single person, if their immune system is adequately functioning, they've got multiple markers of inflammation in the brain going on. And people joke about this. They say, oh, I'm getting older. I don't remember the way I used to. <laughs> well, how old are you? I'm 34. <laughs> yeah, that's not the point. You should be saying that it right. is a problem. <laughs> that's right. I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. So we do the wheat zoomer and the neural zoomer plus on every patient. I've heard, um, I don't, I can't remember what the source on this was, but, um, some practitioners have said there are forms of wheat that are not as genetically modified to accept glyphosate and have less gluten. Um, so are you across the board against wheat uh, or are there forms that you're willing to say like, or not willing yeah, to say, but based on your research, you would say that are okay? I, I understand the question. Um, there has been a five-fold increase in celiac disease since 1950, five-fold. Glyphosate didn't come on the market until the mid-late 90s. That it's not the... Uh, that the wheat is changing that's created this massive problem we have. It's not that. The ancient grains, spelt, kamut, um, einkorn, they all stimulate the same. Once you've crossed the line of tolerance and you're making antibodies to peptides of wheat, it doesn't matter if you eat the ancient grains or not. It's still going to happen. Uh, mm. your, your immune system is there to protect you. And I'll, I, I'll explain why in a moment. There's one study that came out that showed a particular strain of uh, uh, sourdough bread had no immune activation properties at all, that the fermentation process was successful in breaking down the peptides of wheat so that it did not activate a memory response in humans, not animals, in humans. But that sourdough bread was made from six different strains of Lactobacillus San Franciscus. That's the bacteria they use to ferment. Six different strains. That's not commercially viable. But I saw that study. I said, wow, look at this. Someday, somebody's going to figure out how to make sourdough by this process commercially, and people can eat this, and it'll be safe. But that day is not today. It's not here yet. There is no form of wheat that you can eat that's safe once you've crossed the line of tolerance and have elevated antibodies to wheat. How, di uh, how difficult is it for you to get, like, I would imagine if somebody comes and, you know, starts to work with your organization, they're a little bit more likely to be compliant, but... Um, that's How difficult. They're sick. They're, right. That's, so and, there's enough and, pain. And they've been to many doctors, right? They've suffered enough. Right. Like, do you think it's very likely that there'll be kind of a transformative 
I guess, idea come from, that comes from this, that we start to do away with more of the grains and that. I mean, we had the, what, the grains at the bottom of the food pyramid on the back of cereal boxes telling us to buy more cereal. But yeah, I guess, wh where do you see the future of that going? Um, the more education we can do, the more effective I get. And my colleagues who are carrying this message out, uh, the more people that can hear this will start asking the question. And then do the test. Just do the wheat zoomer. If you have any health complaint that is not you're you're not satisfied with the results of how it's being addressed, just do the wheat zoomer. Just go on Google and type in gluten and multiple sclerosis. Look at all the studies: gluten and migraines. Look at all the studies: gluten and rheumatoid arthritis. Look at all the studies that sometimes. And the godfather of autoimmunity, his name is Professor Yehuda Schoenfeld. He's in Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, and to give you a sense of this guy, 28 of the PhDs in immunology who received their immunology PhD in his department in Israel, there are many, many more, but 28 of them chair departments of immunology in med schools and hospitals around the world. They're his students. This is the Godfather. And he published earlier this year. No, no, earlier last year, right? We're in 2023 now. Um, earlier last year on the frequency of gluten, uh, gl the effectiveness of the gluten free diet in non celiac autoimmune diseases. And they identified over 20 different autoimmune diseases. They reviewed over 80 articles. And he said, People get better 79.5% of the time on a gluten-free diet, and this was confirmed in 63% of the studies. So meaning, whatever autoimmune disease you've got, you're more than half likely, you're gonna get better on a gluten-free diet. That's how frequent it is. Sometimes it's the only trigger you have to address. Sometimes it's one of many. Dairy is common. You got, you got mold in your house. You got bacterial infections or viral infection, whatever um, the investigative process shows up. But the concept is wheat is a primary trigger of inflammation and you know, for autoimmune diseases more than oh, what, 63% of the time. Uh, and that inflammation is the mechanism, the gateway in the development of 14 of the top 15 causes of death in the world. Who can argue with this? You just have to check. I, yeah. I, nev I never say everyone needs to stop eating wheat. I never say that because I sound like a nutcase. But I say everyone that has a health problem that they, they don't feel is being comprehensively addressed, needs to do the wheat zoomer because it's the most comprehensive test out there yeah and then go from there yeah so we uh, if there was five things that you could extract from the world to make it healthier be that ideologically or materially <laughs> we know about wheat what would the other four things be um uh help people find their passion help people find their passion and their their lives change Everything about their life changes. Their interactions with their family, with their loved ones, with the world around them changes. Uh, teach people how to take basic care of this vehicle that we have in this lifetime. You know, learn about uh, how to feed it properly, uh, how to hydrate it properly. Make sure you get enough sleep. Critically important. You only heal when you are in that state of being called parasympathetic dominance. We have two different nervous systems. Basically, there's a, a sympathetic fight, flight, or fright, and a parasympathetic. And we only heal when we're in a parasympathetic state. Hmm. That's, that's just basic science. And people don't go into a parasympathetic state during the day very often. They have to work on developing that calmness, but they're supposed to go into a parasympathetic state when they sleep. That's why you repair and you heal when you're sleeping. So you, you have to have good quality sleep. That's critically important. Take care of your frame. 
take care of feeding this body properly, hydrating it properly, um, identify those things that are causing inflammation and find passion. Yeah, that's a, that's a good summary there. So uh, if people are kind of interested in learning about, I know you mentioned your website, but just where they can find more information, where would you send them to learn about what you talked about today? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, the website's the dr.com, uh, the doctor.com. Just don't spell the word doctor out. And there are so many things there. We did a docu-series called Betrayal, the Autoimmune Disease Solution They're Not Telling You. And we've had over a million people watch it. It's free. And uh, I went to Israel. And I interviewed Sean Feld, Professor Sean Feld. I went to England and interviewed Professor Marsh, the godfather of celiac disease. So you meet these world experts. And then I interviewed clinicians who were applying the principles from these experts' research studies, like Mark Hyman, I interviewed Mark, and Jeff Bland, the father of functional medicine, so many of these clinicians. And then we interviewed the clinicians' patients who did what their doctor said, reversing their MS, reversing their lupus. I, I'll never forget the woman in London, 43 years old, she said, you know, I took the tube to come here today. That's the underground train. And she said, and I walked the seven blocks from the tube station here to this interview. And she said, it's not a big deal. And then she paused and she started to tear up. And she said, but it is. And then we show you the picture of her two years ago in a wheelchair. She can't walk. She mm -hmm. has seven, seven lesions on her brain from multiple sclerosis. And then we show you the MRIs of today. She has two lesions on her brain and no symptoms whatsoever. And that's betrayal. And it's with chronic fatigue and major depressive disorder and autoimmune diseases. So the expert, the doctor applying what the researchers have learned, and then the patient following the recommendations of the doctor. And you see it again and again and again. And you realize, wow. There really is a path out of this health crisis that I'm stuck in. You realize there's a path and the goal is to empower you to do something about it. So that's betrayal. It's, it's on our website. And there's, a, uh, there's another link. It's the dr.com backslash. Um, uh, oh, what's the link that we gave for you? you know, I, I'm so bad at that kind All of right, stuff. We'll, we'll have it down below. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll, some, I'll oh, oh, the, the yeah. gut, the gut reboot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's okay. the dr.com uh, forward slash gut dash reboot dash guide. And it's a handout for you that I tell patients all the time. If there's only one thing you're going to do to be healthier, only one, it's build a healthy, diverse microbiome that this has more impact on your entire body than anything else you can do, anything. So the Gut Reboot Guide is a summary of the steps of what it takes uh, to uh, rebuild a healthy, diverse microbiome, and it'll get you started on the right path. Awesome. Well, I, I appreciate it, Doc. Uh, it's been a great conversation, and thanks for jumping on. You're very welcome.